Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is a, a hot topic. Um, and really the session is meant to share our experiences and learnings we've had since we've been in this space. So look forward to, to sharing it all. Now, once, uh, before we really dive in deep, we'd like to just introduce ourselves, um, give a bit more of our background. And for myself, I've been in FinOps for six years now, started with AWS, helping customers with savings plans and RIs. And then that eventually uh, went to me having deeper dive conversations around architectural changes and, and forecasting that spend for contracts. Then in summer 22, I joined Grammarly to lead their FinOps strategy. Uh, so I was their first and only uh, FinOps dedicated person. And with that come, you know, anything that falls into the FinOps scope fell into my scope. So reporting, uh, GPU, Gen AI, capacity management, uh, contract negotiations. So I still lead that for, uh, for Grambling now. And also I am a AI, AI working group member. So we've actually released a couple of papers now, um, which you should see some information on those here later. Hey everybody, I'm Jason Rhodes. I uh, work for Intuit, um, big, big cloud user. Uh, I've been doing FinOps for a long, long time. Uh, we started back in 2015, believe it or not, um, before FinOps was cool. Um, and you know, I like to think that we sort of hit run state or sort of solved most of the big problems that everybody tends to face in FinOps somewhere around 2019. So we've still been iterating and innovating since then, but uh, it's mostly been sort of a solved problem uh, into it. But there's still things that, that pop up from time to time, things like Gen AI that require us to kind of go back to the well and um, dig out the FinOps tool set to, to solve those new things. And I have some strong feelings on, uh, you'll hear a lot about tokens in the world of Gen AI, which you don't hear about uh, in other sort of cloud things usually. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about tokens later, but I have some strong feelings on that. Yep, that'll be fun. <laughs> um, so today's session, we're gonna start with just how Grammarly and Intuit are using and operating around Gen AI. We'll talk about, as practitioners, our journeys into this space. Uh, also, uh, we'll dive deep into managing closed source LLMs. So this is your AWS Bedrock, your Azure Open AI, these API, generative AI platforms that are really the turnkey way for businesses to use generative AI. Uh, so we'll dive deep into how to manage that, the capacity there and our challenges we've seen. And then we'll go over what our next challenges are and questions, of course. So starting with Grammarly, if those of you not familiar with Grammarly, we are a writing assistant. Uh, so we provide suggestions on how to obviously fix grammatical errors and spelling, but also uh, to, to adjust your tone. Even be more friendly, you know, tell Grammarly to make your, your whatever you're saying more friendly if you wanted it to be, to uh, actually providing more clarity. Um, we've been doing this uh, for 15 years, so well before the Gen AI boom, and we have over 30 million daily active users, and we also have an enterprise product that has over 70,000 teams uh, called Grammarly Business. Uh, and uh, one of the key differentiators for us is our integration with over 500,000 apps and sites. So we do have a desktop app, mobile app, and we also have an extension. So with those things, no matter where you're writing, Grammarly is there providing suggestions to help you. So you know copy and pasting needed, very seamless interface. And with uh, you know, Gen AI, we were really early adopters of this technology and have a couple examples here of how we're, we're some of the features that are using it. I will say the bulk of our suggestions definitely are outside of Gen AI and based on other technology but uh, we are continuing to innovate in the Gen AI space. All right, and hopefully most of you guys know about Intuit or you know, hopefully use TurboTax, do your taxes every year, or if you happen to have a small business or something on the side, uh, QuickBooks is our small business offering. Um, our, our headline sort of Gen AI uh, offering at this point is called Intuit Assist, which is essentially a, a really sort of up-leveled uh, support or assistance uh, experience that we've integrated across our products. Um, one of the things I want to talk about here, though, is what we call our Gen OS platform. And the idea here is that, you know, Intuit's a very large organization. We have about 7,000 developers out of about 15,000 employees. And as we go to, like, embed Gen AI across all of our services and products, we don't want, like, every team at the company having to solve the same sort of common problems themselves. So we've invested in a centralized platform we call Gen OS that solves a lot of the, the problems that, like, or, or things you're going to have to do once for everybody. So it's like things like monitoring and logging, security, compliance, like having the right controls to make sure that the data is going to the right places. It's also like from a developer's point of view, it's a singular way of interfacing with 
the entire collection of, of models and technologies that we've made available to developers inside Intuit. So uh, we use at least a little bit of everything that's out there. As we'll talk about in a bit, there's, there's just constant, uh, just a race of evolution going on with new vendors, new models. Uh, it's moving at a much faster pace right now than any other sort of aspect of what's going on in the cloud. And so it just sort of forces you to be, take a very dynamic uh, approach to these things because with the race that's going on, you don't want to be uh, sort of uh, left behind. Um, yeah, and you know, for those of you maybe not super familiar with like, you know, you're, you're, there's, AI is a tremendous buzz. The NVIDIA stock is getting a lot of attention. Uh, AI has been around a long time. Uh, you know, if you've used a product like SageMaker, you maybe have heard of machine learning. These sorts of things have been around for a long, long time now. But in the last you know, year, 18 months, this space has gotten tremendous increased attention because of LLMs, things like ChatGPT. Anybody can just go and, and have fun with it and have it, you know, your kids can have it write their essays for them, things like that. So it's getting a lot more buzz now and there's just this, there's kind of a, 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 a two-fold race that's going on. So one of the races is between you know, OpenAI, Google, Anthropic, Amazon, the companies, the vendors that are generating these technologies to be the one that sort of gets the lion's share of the business. So that's, that's one of the races that's happening because whoever sort of makes the biggest breakthroughs first, everybody's gonna go to them, right? And everybody else will kind of lose out. So that's, that's one of the races that you see happening. There's deals and new models, like, uh, you know, I made this slide a few weeks ago, but like yesterday, uh, Anthropic released Claude 3.5. So there's, like this stuff is it's moving really, really fast, much faster than uh, any other service or thing that's going on uh, in the cloud. But the other race that's going on is, is amongst sort of the consumer side of Gen AI. And so this is any like software-based business where this technology could be used to enhance your products and offerings. Uh, if, if you're in a, a competitive space, whether you know, there's Grammarly or Intuit or any of your organizations, if you've got competitors out there, your leaders see your organization's ability to successfully integrate Gen AI into your products and offerings as a key differentiator, right? And so that's the other race that's going on is to not only you know, the, the people making the best stuff, but it's also to have sort of most intelligently wielded these next generation technologies to give your business a competitive advantage. Because if you're ignoring this space and your competitors aren't, you're gonna get left in the dust. So these are kind of the two races that are going on uh, in the industry. And again, Josh and I are sort of both on the consumer side of things, but uh, it's playing out uh, on both sides. Um, and what, what, something we're gonna go really deep on here, and hopefully it's not, not too dull, but is some aspects of how generative AI isn't just, this isn't like a new compute service or a new thing that, that sort of fits the mold of everything you're used to across your, across your uh, public cloud providers. Uh, there's a lot that's very different about this, uh, particularly around capacity management, which hopefully that doesn't sound too boring, but um, a lot of what like, we've gotten used to in the cloud, for those of us, you that have been around a long time, maybe managed stuff in the data center before, you, you got to know capacity planning and having to make sure that you bought enough servers and storage and things to handle the peak of your business. And with the move to the cloud, it was this great relief that that went away because of the elasticity of the cloud. You now you just provision just what you needed, just when you need it. Uh, you didn't have to like think months or you know, further in advance to make sure you had all your, your gear lined up because you could get it like that when you needed it. Uh, but that does, that, that's not the case with Gen AI. Um, again, back to NVIDIA, and, and there's other vendors too, but there's so much demand for the very specialized hardware that underpins the leading edge Gen AI technology that everybody wants it, right? And so if, if, if your organization depends on it as a consumer, you're gonna be fighting with your competitors and with everybody else for this very, very limited supply of these high-end GPU systems that make this stuff work. And so what that means is if, if that technology and that hardware is a key part of your offerings, you've got to be thinking much further in advance around what am I going to do to make sure I have the capacity of that specialized hardware to meet the needs of my organization for whatever, whether it's a new product launch, a new feature, whatever it is, way in advance. And that's something that, again, most of us that if you came into the cloud in the last few years, there's really no other... Uh, precedent for this in the, the public cloud world. I mean, maybe you've been iced or something uh, once or twice, you're running in a funny region or whatever, but um, capacity management is a very key part of it. And for the FinOps practitioner, this is something you maybe haven't had to deal with before. So again, we'll be, we'll be going very deep on that. 
Um, just real quick on my journey, um, you know, again, I've been at this a really long time. Uh, we started managing prepay and stuff back in 2016. Uh, we automated allocations and shared costs and things by 2018 or so. And again, like in 2019, I think, I think we hit run state. So I've uh, been sort of running ever since. Um, but you know, last year, Gen AI uh, sort of landed and became a new problem that we had to get some of our attention. So thankfully, we're sort of, it's getting, we're able to give a lot of our attention because we've got sort of everything else more or less figured out. But um, that's my journey. Uh, my journey, uh from, from an AI standpoint, really started with Grammarly. I, I didn't have any direct AI experience at AWS. Uh, so when I joined Grammarly, I was reporting on training and inference calls, just understanding what those are, what that means, how they work. Um, and then the next level from that is, uh, you know, we had to kind of adapt to the GPU shortage. I'm sure we're the only customer in here that's experienced that. But uh, yeah, it, it's still an adaptation, it's still in process, but making sure that our researchers get the resources they need without us wasting too much money, because it's, it's impossible to avoid waste in these days uh, with GPUs. And then more recently, uh, just over a year ago, I started managing our, our third-party LLM capacity. And uh, we were very early adopters of that, which in that stage, that means there's little to no documentation on that service. So engineers had what they needed to, to get moving, but Documentation on how, where the billing data lives, how it works, um, best practices, none of that existed. On top of that, every week, at least a few times a month, it, changes were happening, price increases. There were you know, new models coming out, capacity types changing. So uh, no documentation, trying to kind of build that plane as you're flying it, and then it's constantly changing along the way. And then you know, at Grammarly, we do have very innovative engineering team. So they were wanting to release these new services and looking for help in forecasting this usage for this brand new service we had no documentation on, and, and it was near impossible to forecast much there. Uh, so it was a lot of just learning as we go, um, and uh, yeah, again, we're here today to kind of share a lot of those learnings. So before I really dive into this, I do want to just add one more piece around what managing a closed source LLM really means. And again, it's back to those generative API platforms. Um, so I say closed source LLMs, but you can also, for example, in Bedrock access open source LLMs. And you can do the same thing in Azure as well. So it's not just closed source, but any time you're, you're just using an API to access these LLMs. Now, before I dive in deep, just wanted to go over a few terms. I won't touch on all of these. Um, but the top one here uh, is tokens. If you've been involved in AI at all, you've heard this term tokens. And, Think of that as you know, the units that the LLM has to break that prompt into in order to process it, and then, it, then provide an output on top of that. That's all broken up into tokens. That measures the size of the request. The size of the request dictates how much compute resources are needed to process that. So tokens provide a way to measure, okay, this, this service is gonna have this, average number of tokens per request, this number of requests per minute, we can get an idea of how much capacity it's gonna need based on the tokens. And uh, combined with that is throughput. If you've been in tech for long, you've heard about throughput. And in this case, it's more around, it's, it's based on tokens, um, to his dismay. Um, and tokens meaning this, how many tokens per second or per minute can you pass through this endpoint or per capacity unit that you're purchasing? That's all that throughput is. All right, so tokens, um, not my favorite thing. Uh, this is, if, if any of you are you're getting ready to get into Genevra, I, I just this is sort of, take this as a warning about this. That this is gonna probably happen to you is that people are gonna get confused about this because every model, uh, every vendor will use to talk about tokens. They'll talk about input tokens and output tokens. But in every case, it's really just sort of a proxy for some other actual skew, right? Whether it's words or characters of input to the model with different levels of inference, or again on the output side, different numbers of characters or words on the output side. You don't see this anywhere else. It's not like when you, you're storing data in S3, it's not like you're buying S3 storage tokens where there's like 10 different types. And so it's, it's just a really confusing, messy layer that gets injected in the middle of all this. And so you, you, in FinOps, you, guys, you hear a lot about unit economics and the ability to sort of you know, map parts of your business to you know, cost per customer, cost per different thing going on in your business. You sort of have to apply that muscle just out of the box in the Gen AI space 
to translate your spend on Gen AI you know, into business things because you're not, you're not gonna get that in the bill. Like it's, you're gonna see, oh, I paid this much money for this many tokens, but what did that, what did that give me? It, it's giving you words of input or words of output from these different models. And people will get confused. They'll think that because you know, this use case used this many tokens of that model with that vendor, that it's gonna use the same number of tokens with some other model. Like everybody around you is gonna fumble this. So just you know, help them not do that uh, by being wary of tokens uh, so that those things don't happen to you. The second thing too I think that's important, I, use, I don't know if anybody's played Fortnite here or has kids who do, but you know, there's a reason that like every mobile app and, and game with microtransactions and things, especially the ones geared at kids, they always use virtual currencies is because it psychologically divorces you from the fact that what you're doing costs money. Right, and so, oh, I'm not spending money, I just, you know, I use some tokens, right? Like, those are, those don't, so, like, th there's a real risk here that, that your engineers, again, like, back to Werner, you know, every engineering decision is a purchasing decision. The, the fact that there's this abstraction layer here in generative AI means that people are, are it's gonna have, a, everybody's gonna have a much harder time translating the, the choices that they're making into real economic terms. And so this is, like, you're gonna have to try really hard where you are to, uh, help make sure that that isn't happening, that everybody understands the economic implications of the choices that they're making uh, so that they realize that it's real money. And I, I hope to see, I mean, for anybody, any Gen AI vendor that's out there, please just stop with the tokens. Just express your costs in terms of, you know, just stop with it. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. token, this, you know, this, I don't know if anybody's old enough to know Chuck E. Cheese, but like, this is the guy who likes tokens, okay? Don't be this guy. <laughs> That's the scariest Chucky I've ever seen. <laughs> um, okay, so with these API platforms, you have two capacity options. You have shared or on-demand capacity and provision, or also known as dedicated capacity. Shared capacity is gonna be similar to most cloud services you're used to. There's no commitment. You only pay for what you use. A little nuance is availability is not guaranteed. Um, it's still based on GPU machines and how much the vendor has, right? But I would equate this to say the same as an EC2 instance. It seems like EC2 is limitless, but it's not, especially depending on the machines. Well, in this case, there is a risk with shared capacity that it may not be available. But I would say that that's the lower risk. The higher risk is performance is gonna be inconsistent with shared capacity in most cases. Uh, you're sharing this with other customers, so maybe at, at off hours, you have very good latency, very good performance, but maybe at the peak hours of the day, you're seeing five, six, seven seconds in latency in increase from before, just because your request is getting put into a queue and it'll serve it when it can. The other side of that is dedicated capacity where you are getting a GPU clusters that you probably don't have hardly any insight into, but you're getting this block of capacity that are GPU clusters, clusters dedicated to you. Uh, so that means that you should have much lower consistent latency with these, so the performance is gonna be much better, but you are paying upfront for this. And it is, does require at least a month commitment up to 12 month commitment, depending on you know, your flavor. Uh, this does provide a fixed amount of throughput. And to his point around tokens, you know, measuring this throughput in tokens, a token for one model is different for, than another model. So, GPT-4, for example, takes a lot, has a lot lower throughput because it's such a bigger model than 3.5 turbo. So every, every model, it changes the throughput per capacity unit. Um, definitely by the vendor, it changes. So this is a fuzzy number, um, and you have to, again, help your engineering teams come to a you know, somewhat ideal solution on, on how much they would actually need. Um, another issue here is it does not scale with usage. It's reserve capacity. So you buy it, you've paid for it, no matter if you use it or not. So if you have usage that for this use case that's scaling up and down with business hours, you're gonna have low utilization. And a new dynamic for me, myself, at least in FinOps, is that if you don't get enough capacity for a, a production service with high visibility, you're gonna have an outage. So my decisions can actually cause an outage for the business. And that's scary. And because of the fixed nature of this, you're having to buy capacity based on the expected peak usage, meaning you're gonna have low utilization of this capacity. So I, I really 
kind of focus on this point because you may look at dedicated capacity for these vendors and say, oh, this is gonna save me a bunch of money because we're getting a lot more tokens for a lot cheaper versus the, uh, the on-demand rate. Well, yeah, you only get that if you're using 90% utilization all the time. You're not gonna see those savings. It's, it's more so a decision to have for performance rather than cost savings. Um, but there's nuances to that, which I'll get into. So these are examples of the considerations I have when an engineering team comes to me and says, okay, we wanna release this new product. What type of capacity should we use? Uh, and I'll go over a few of these, not all of them, but a lot of them work in conjunction. First and foremost, latency tolerance. You know, if they don't really need low consistent latency, they can probably just use shared capacity and you're gonna save money that way in most cases. But another piece is application priority. So maybe they, they uh, don't necessarily need the low latency, but it's a high visibility product and it is a streaming type of usage, streaming meaning live, like your customers are, are, are using it. So yeah, you probably do wanna go ahead and get it on dedicated capacity just to make sure it is gonna be a good experience for your customer. And then another piece here is failover logic, which is something that's new, where you're actually chaining the capacities together. And this is where you need engineering help. But what this way this works is, let's say a request goes through and the dedicated capacity can't serve it. It'll automatically retry on shared capacity. You have to engineer that, but that can be done. By doing that, one, it mitigates the risk of your users experiencing an error. Two, it opens the door for optimization possibilities if you have that chaining logic set up, maybe with some additional logic added in. Um, but yeah, these are all the considerations I have as I go through these. Yeah, I put this together. This is kind of a, what I think of as like a, a Goldilocks matrix in terms of you know, how you should think about the, the risks of messing up your capacity management as applied to different use cases that you see in your business. So as Josh was talking about, there's sort of a continuum of uh, uh, sort of latency uh, expectations and uh, you know ability to still work well. You know if things if the capacity isn't there to meet the need really quickly. So at, at like one end of that continuum, you have things like an offline job that's maybe just doing you know text summarization at night or something like that. That thing, if it takes a few extra seconds to run, nobody cares, right? That's totally perfectly fine. So in the case where there isn't enough capacity to sort of handle that super fast, that's okay, right? Um, but if, if you happen to have like way overbought and all of your use cases are these sort of asynchronous things, you're just, you're just wasting you know, a ton of money there. Um, at the other end of the spectrum is like what Josh was talking about are things where maybe it's part of an interactive experience that your customers not only are using but have paid for, right? Where they expect a quick response from the application. And in those situations, especially when they're paying for it, um, there's, you know, you're gonna lose a whole lot of goodwill if that thing just suddenly slows down and stops working so well. So um, that's, that's the other sort of side of risk as well is where you've underbought capacity for those mission critical, you know, where low latency is, is expected by your customers and you're not delivering it. That, that can essentially be seen as a failure of your, your product to meet its uh, expectations. There's things in the middle there, like, you know, things that are fun or, you know, demo type things where maybe, you know, you've got to sort of hedge you know, the pros and cons of, of overbuying versus underbuying, but, and, and odds are also that within your organization, you're gonna have a mixture of these use cases going on. It won't just be everything at one end or the other. You'll have a mixture and, and how you sort of broker your available capacity against these use cases. Again, that's something that our, our GenOS platform helps us do, but um, that's not something you're gonna get out of the box from anybody. So that's another sort of challenge in, in how you uh, sort of employ your use cases against the capacity you have. All right, so there's a few scenarios I wanna go through and different ways to manage this capacity. First one, I just refer to it as managing it like a data center. And this is, as you would expect, the most expensive way to do it, but it ensures um, highly performing applications. So in this, this uh, scenario, you have an application that requires you know, low consistent latency, it's business critical. You do have failover to shared capacity implemented, but you wanna minimize it. So in this case, because capacity can take days to weeks to get more of it when you need it, you target peak utilization to be 75%. That could look like, okay, for 70, our, our usage hits 75% at peak three times, you know, or three consecutive days, and we know it's gonna continue to grow next month because of a launch, we should probably go ahead and get some, ask for some more capacity. Um, so in this scenario, uh, this graph now, 
the yellow represents utilization percentage of the provision capacity. And again, this scenario, we're assuming that we have enough capacity to serve all the, the production traffic. The blue line represents the uh, cumulative costs over the 30-day time frame of the provision capacity. And then the red represents the cumulative cost if all of that usage is on share capacity instead. And then the green represents what I call the premium you would be paying for provision capacity um, in this case, or the delta between the two. So in the beginning, you see that you know, it's peaking at 75, almost 80% utilization, and costs are remaining pretty even until the weekend. And then you see share capacity get cheaper. Cumulative cost is already getting cheaper there get into the middle of the period, even when the utilization is still going beyond 55% um, utilization, uh, the premium is still growing. So that's still not the break-even mark for utilization as far as from a, a cost standpoint. And then at the end of the period, finally, when it's consistently hitting 68% utilization, then it's, it's staying pretty flat. That delta is not growing. So this tells me the break-even point in this scenario is about 70% utilization. The issue, though, is by running everything on dedicated capacity, in this usage patterns at least, provision capacity costs 33% more than shared. So this is an example of it is not a way to reduce costs. It is meant for getting performance, the best performance for whatever you're using it for. Now, the next scenario, let's say you're, you're, flex, you're a bit more flexible with your performance needs. You're okay with up to 30% of your requests at peak times filling over to shared capacity. Now, most traffic still needs to have low consistent latency, and it is business critical, but you add in some logic to actually throttle certain services. Uh, because even when you're scaling over or failing over to shared capacity, it's not limitless. So you still need to probably have some, some logic to say, okay, this application we use internally, let's start throttling that when we start you know, going beyond a certain point. So this scenario, same graph, we have less dedicated capacity here, so the utilization percentages are higher for the yellow, and the green is actually representing the blended cumulative cost between the two. So this is what you've already paid for with the provision capacity, that cumulative cost, and then when you do use shared capacity, the cost for the shared capacity as well. So at peak, 27% of requests filled over to shared capacity. That's okay, that's still within our threshold. At the end of the period, the blended cost per token, though, was actually 15% less than the on-demand rate. So in this case, just by having a little bit more flexibility with your performance needs, you're actually getting a discount versus running it on-demand, on the on-demand shared capacity. And you, know, you would think 30% seems like a high threshold. In this scenario, less than 1% of requests over the entire period actually used shared capacity. So, Depending on the business, this may or may not be a big deal, but that was quite small when I was running these numbers. I was surprised. The, the last scenario is a kind of more of a cowboy approach. Um, you're, you have these, these use cases. You don't really need low consistent latency, so you just want to pay the lowest cost per token possible. Uh, you still have some throttling logic there just because, again, shared capacity isn't limitless. You need to add a quota if, if you hit certain points. You want to be able to throttle um, when you need to. So same numbers, as, or same graph as before. Uh, the lines represent the same thing. We have even less dedicated capacity here. So at peak, 90% of requests did fill over to shared capacity. So this is cowboying it. <laughs> that's, that's quite a bit. Uh, but by the end of the period, just because you, you're like, oh, we don't really need provision capacity, but we have the usage for it, so let's just use it to optimize our rate, this is saving 32% versus running it on demand, those rates. So these are getting to your one year savings plan and RI rates just by leveraging provision capacity um, with this usage. And then even with that kind of cowboy approach, less than 13% of, of requests filled over to share capacity in this, this time frame. Um, so that could be a big deal to a business, it couldn't be, who knows. Um, depends on, on the use cases, but, uh, but again, th this is an example of how to potentially take these, uh, these different capacity types and use them to actually optimize your rate. Now, you may look at this and say, Josh, you know, show me these graphs. Like, how do I know I'm doing this right? Or how do I know that um, I'm looking at, the, looking at this the right way when I'm evaluating this capacity? 
Uh, first and foremost, understand what triggers the insufficient capacity error with whatever capacity you're using. Some of it, some, some capacity types, some, some vendors, it's pure resource utilization. Uh, but that's a soft limit. Uh, there's a lot of variables that can make that lower or higher, um, and it can change over time, depending on the, the, how your new applications that are using the, 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 the platform, um, how, you know, I've seen where vendors have actually made their clusters more efficient, so our throughput increased there. So lots of, lots of variables there that can kind of change that. Uh, the next one is actually there is a capacity types out there where the vendor is determining a certain latency limit, and once you hit that, it's going to trigger the error. So understanding that is key. Um, and then there are other vendors that just have hard token limits. It's maximum amount of input, maximum amount of output tokens, much easier to manage. Um, but uh, th those are the three types I've seen. Now, once you understand that, you can set KPIs. I can imagine utilization percentage not being one of those, but also if you do have a, a kind of a tolerance for sharing, uh, failing over to shared capacity for these production services, you could have a, you know, maybe that's 10 or 15%, maybe not 30, but you could have that as another KPI, or your own latency limits. Maybe there are certain services that, that you want low latency and you want to kind of buy capacity according to that, and other services, it's not important. But one of the biggest takeaways I've had over my time doing this is uh, you want to load test this capacity periodically. It's not do it one time and think it's going to be set that way. I've, I've seen throughput change in less than a year by 50%, increased by 50%. So if you're not load testing these endpoints weekly or at least quarterly, you're not going to know that and you're going to continue to buy capacity at too high of a level. This is also a great way to find out if your clusters are healthy before you launch in production. Um, because you know, these, again, are just a bunch of machines put together and it's, it's very likely that, well, not very, but it does happen that you get a cluster and you start using it and it's not as performant as it's, supposed, as, as it's supposed to be and the vendor has to fix something, right? But if you're load testing, you're gonna catch that much earlier um, and, and uh, be on top of it. Yeah, that's a good point, Josh. Just real quick too, I mean, um, back to sort of the gold rush is that, that vendors are moving as fast as they can to be leaders in this space and so a lot of the sort of like regimented process that surrounds like a traditional launch of services of these major cloud vendors or you know, these startups that never had those, those aren't necessarily gonna be in place. So there's a lot of like extra caution you need to take as a FinOps person to uh, keep your company from getting caught off guard as, as things are changing constantly. Um, just real quick on forecasting for capacity, some experiences we've had. Uh, in the early days, nobody's, I mean, this is like, like cloud 3.0 or whatever. It's, it's gonna be very different and teams are gonna have a hard time predicting what their actual consumption of these services is going to be. So uh, one thing I'd say is just try to make it simple for people. We, we tried getting way down in the details of wanting to know, you know tokens uh, per model, per hour, you know, like really low level stuff so that we could, assuming that the inputs were correct, that we could optimize our capacity management and purchases. Uh, but it was just, that's way too hard for people in the early days. Uh, and depending on the sort of the way the wind's blowing, there may be just, like an over an abundance of enthusiasm where people are really optimistic in what they're gonna do that maybe doesn't play out. So uh, you can add value to this process by just sort of not push back, but just help make sure everybody's sort of really double check things. Have they done experiments that sort of validate their inputs to the model, uh, help rationalize things to, to keep your initial part. I mean, you're gonna mess up, but like it help at least minimize the amount of mess up that happens. Uh, in the early days. And it comes back to like the matrix and what Josh has been talking about too, which is really understanding, like you're gonna err, but are you, whether you err on the side of having purchased too much or too little, really should be dictated by your understanding of how the, the ramifications of that play out in your different use cases, right? So if there's, maybe there's, there's no margin for, there's no money to be spent or wasted, well, you probably need to err on the low side and hopefully that your use cases are acceptable with that. But um, for a big company like Intuit and probably Grammarly, um, you know, there's probably, it's, you're, it's probably safer to err on the high side and then just ratchet back down once you realize, oh, hey, maybe we didn't need all that, but um, it's tough. So our next challenge is, um, I've been pushing hard for programmatic load testing <laughs> with our ML, ML engineering team. Um, and they've actually recently implemented it. Uh, but the next iteration of that is, I wanna be able to go in and load test these new models of these endpoints myself, or have engineering teams be able to easily go in there and do that, um, instead of having to rely on our, our MLM for team to kind of do all of that. So just making it a bit more self-sufficient and 
being able to duplicate live traffic without interrupting production because that's how you get the best kind of benchmark. Instead of having a bunch of machines just hit an endpoint really hard, if you have live traffic, that's gonna give you much more accurate results than just you know, normal load testing. Um, and also just simplify our researchers' ability to, to access more models. We want our researchers to access all the models that they want to access, right? So we want to kind of simplify that process, you know, some of what y'all you, have done with GenOS, uh, but we're working toward uh, making that happen as well. And for us, um, you know, one of the things we haven't done yet with GenAI is, is uh, allocate those costs. So we still are taking a very simplistic sort of paid for out of the center thing. It's still very much in the sort of just go, go, go uh, experimentation and launch phase. But as, as things mature and the sort of uh, vendors and the, the patterns uh, sort of crystallize, we expect that we'll be able to implement, you know, traditional allocations that everybody knows exactly uh, how much every different thing they did cost with uh, the capacity cost incorporated in that, which can be tricky because, uh, the, the, you know, again, there's this is sort of unprecedented in that you end up with a large spend for this sort of centralized capacity, but, like, how do you distribute this cost of that capacity out to all the different people that are actually running their models on that capacity, especially in the periods where the utilization is low. Like, it would make that, th those things look really expensive if you pass that full net cost through. So there's still some challenges that are there to work out how we're going to allocate that capacity cost. Uh, and the other thing, too, is just, you know, anything you can use, you can use poorly, and Janae has no exception. So how do we de begin to detect the sort of, like, wasteful or suboptimal patterns that people have put in place? What are they, you know, are they making all the, like, are they using the optimized model for what they're doing? Are they making unnecessary calls? Uh, do, are they, do they have more... Uh, you know, context than they really need for the application. So I think this is, the rest of the cloud, we've gotten pretty sophisticated in finding where people are messing up and helping them fix it, but uh, that's gonna be another frontier here for Gen AI. And then the last piece here, I do have a link, um, or just you know, make everybody aware that there is a uh, paper from the AI Working Group, How to Forecast AI Services in the Cloud. It goes in a lot deeper um, around just all the different AI systems out there, but including, you know, API platforms like we've talked about today. So now we have time for questions. Wow, wow. Big round of applause, everyone, for Josh and Jason. Thank you. That was packed full of tips. Great session, guys. We do have five or six minutes for Q&A. So oh, here we got one in the back. We'll kick it off. Hi, thank you for that. What did you use for the measurements, the utilization measurements? Um, was that an in-house or like, how did you do that? And how can you tell, part B, um, what workloads are driving the utilization, right? Are you able to separate, or is that just sort of a cumulative or aggregate measurement? Great question. So the measurement is really based on that load test and the accuracy of that load test. Once you know what your maximum is, then that's what you base your utilization on. The next, because you can, the, the vendor does provide the tokens per minute that you are you're pushing through these endpoints. So you can get metrics on that. So again, once you know the max, you can figure out utilization. Um, we also have what we call an LLM proxy um, on our side that is tracking the consumption data by calling service into these LLMs. So that's, a, that's how I take that information. It's as simple of, okay, this service used 35% you know, of this model's capacity, then it gets 35% of those calls. So it's a simple allocation for that right now, but that, that's how we do it. I don't know. If it's all you. It's all okay. Um, so, hi. <laughs> uh, I realize the, uh, the, the issue with the, the word token, right, kind of struck a chord with everyone in the group. We, we all think it's pretty obscure and, and difficult to understand. But I think there's a lot of other units in the cloud space that also don't make any sense, like gigabyte months, right? Um, <laughs> like, what, what even is that? So I guess my question would be, if given that it is confusing and that, uh, you know, it, there at least seems to be some sort of cohesion throughout all the generative models to, to base everything off of tokens. Is there something or another unit that you would suggest or prefer for people to, to put out? Because large language models operate on tokens, and so I, what, what could be a better unit? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for, you know, for every token that has its, every token has its own rate, you can see like what you're getting. You're getting you know, for this model, you're getting this many words or characters of input with this level of context. And so, like, to me, like, the skew should just be expressed as, like, words of input with this context, like, as the skew, right? So the word token doesn't need to be there. So it's, like, model, words, context, 
like is what you're getting, sort of like the usage type or something if you've seen the AWS curve. So like that's what I'd like to see as opposed to token. Another question? Uh, I think I saw one in the back maybe or yeah. Thank you. That first slide was, I think, was really foundational, not just another cloud service. And with generative AI, a bunch of other stakeholders are now kind of swarming in. Like, they might have been doing something in a corner, and the platform team stood it up, and now it's wide open. How do you recommend people kind of socialize this understanding and knowledge, the, the differences, long before you kind of get down to the level of detail you were talking about, just in terms of stakeholder preparation and orientation and, and kind of laying the groundwork for that? Did you get that question? Yeah, I mean, I, I can try to answer. Um, I mean, I, I, it's going to be different everywhere you are. Uh, I can say, with, like, within Intuit, we're just very aggressively pursuing AI as a, as a core uh, capability of the business, and we have, we have for some time. Uh, and so, like, you know, we're very much in an innovate and grow kind of, of state. So anything anybody needs to do that facilitates, uh, you know, us getting better at Gen AI is sort of already... Like we have very high uh, top-down support. If, if there were something, if you're in a different position where maybe there wasn't that same support or you're having to sell people on it, uh, your challenges may be different than the ones that we have. But uh, at least for us, that the sort of getting stakeholder buy-in hasn't, hasn't been an issue. Yeah, I mean, in our case, our, you know, again, we're very much in innovate mode, especially in this space. Um, but our, our leadership is looking for, they want to understand where the money's going and why it's going there. Um, but you know, they also want to give teams the autonomy to innovate. Um, so I'm more just like the messenger and then trying to, to uh, you know, keep it as low as I can. Um, so that, that's our view on it. Hey, great presentation, guys. Thank you for the tips. Uh, Two-part question. One is uh, what do you use when you talk about, um, do you use like a monitoring solution or is it like a shift left? Um, type of thing for engineers uh, to find that wasted, re those wasted resources? Like, do you have something that alerts and then you take action on it? Or is it like, hey, we've implemented best practices so our engineers know not to waste on XYZ uh, data that we get and feedback to the engineering team? And then the second one, uh, I think you mentioned something about LLM proxy. I was just wondering the tech behind what you're talking about, if you don't mind sharing that and where it fits in your stack when it comes to LLMs and, and AI. Um, yeah, I can't speak as much to the tech of the LLM proxy, um, <laughs> but it was something our, our ML Infra team had, had put together. And I will say from a FinOps practitioner standpoint, when you're getting involved in managing this, you, you need to have a really good relationship with the team building those things, because they built that based on our feedback, right? So that is critical. Um, and the first question escaped me, I'm sorry. What was the... Uh, it was about, I think it was about waste. I mean, I mean, all I, the waste piece. Yeah. Well, yeah, and the waste piece... So this is, it's a managed service, this capacity. So you have no insight into the, the, the machines themselves, right? So the waste is kind of expected. Now, where we kind of, I, I wouldn't say, I, where we hold teams accountable is get your forecast somewhere close to right. <laughs> so, so at least give us some kind of heads up or don't just start hitting these endpoints without running it through FinOps first so we can make sure we're managing the capacity. So it's, it's less about identifying waste, it's just making sure that we're informed and, and uh, from what they're doing so we know how to manage that capacity moving forward. So every, every time a new service wants to hit um, the, the, the production endpoints or they want to run an experiment, they come to me and, and ask, you know, hey, you know, how do we handle this? Um, and I, that is critical. Without that, then, you know, it'd be bad. <laughs> so. Um, what all data sources do you use for this analysis, right? Capacity planning, cost estimation, and then later allocation. Do you use, obviously, the CUR and all those cost and milling data? And what other data sources do you use? Uh, sure. Uh, so the question was, you know, what data sources do you use to kind of do this analysis? And you know, Google Sheets is part of that for me, unfortunately. But no, uh, you know, the, the vendors are going to have dashboards for you to see active tokens, and then you said the interval, so you can get that. But it's still, you're, you're like I was saying, it's, there's not a lot of. It's kind of like AWS ten years ago. Um, when you just didn't have many cost tool, tooling out there and it evolved over time. Well, we're really early days in this type of thing, so they have some tooling out there, but you still have to piecemeal. Okay, 
I know in my head we have X amount of tokens you know, per minute available and I see that right now we're at this amount. And then I just do the math from there and calculate it from there or add that to a SQL query that's calculating that in some report that I'm doing. So the data source is really just uh, you know, the, uh, the proxy that I'm spoken to and I kind of compare that to what the vendor shows just to make sure I know that's accurate and then the, the metrics that the vendor provides. All right, absolutely fantastic presentation, um, by the way. I think this is really relevant to most of us in the room. My question is around, um, like, how do you predict your load tests, right? Because we're all developing new features in Gen AI, but we don't actually know, like, how our customers are going to adapt those, right? So, like, what do those loads look like in, in, you know, in production in real time? So just curious on what criteria you use to kind of figure that out. So the teams usually run an experiment, a live experiment before, um, you know, officially going GA with it, right? So what that does, maybe it's 1% of traffic or 5% of traffic. So once you, once you kind of throw it out there and do 1% or 5% of the traffic and it's consuming, you know, millions more tokens than you expected, then you know, okay, I need to kind of roll this back and maybe figure out how to make it more, um, more optimal. But that, that's kind of the first piece. Load testing tells you how much the endpoint can handle, but for forecasting those services, I've learned that they just need to do an experiment first you know, very small amount of traffic, and then that helps you kind of gauge, okay, if it's 1% here, you know, 10x, you know, what's that going to look like? Yeah, or 100x, actually. All right, guys, that wraps us at time. I know there's probably a lot of questions left. I'd be willing to bet you'd be happy to answer a few more outside in the hallway. Okay. That was fantastic Thank presentation. You. Thank you guys so much. We'll get ready for the next crew to come in. Thanks for watching. Check out more FinOps X 2024 content on our YouTube channel on the 2024 playlist. Support our channel by liking, subscribing, clicking the notification bell, and by leaving comments and questions for our speakers. We appreciate your support.